Many in our society today are physically sick with various ailments, including COVID. Many also have emotional, mental, or spiritual problems because knowingly or unknowingly, they are sinning, which is breaking God's spiritual law of love. Let's go to Matthew 9. Matthew 9, please. Jesus was in the house of Matthew, tax collector. Some of the Pharisees, uh, they saw that Jesus was eating with tax collectors and sinners. And they, they asked him, you know, the verse 11, the Pharisees saw, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. We see several things in this verse. We see Jesus spoke positively of the medical profession in his time, even though we might think it was primitive by comparison to us today. Doctors then and now can do certain things to alleviate physical suffering and pain. Jesus acknowledged that sick people need a physician. Seeing a doctor does not have to diminish in any way our trust in the absolute power and prerogative of our God to miraculously heal at any time. We should go to God first, and then we should do all that we can responsibly do to maintain and improve our physical health. So going on to the last verse. From the context, it's hard to escape the idea in the last sentence that the verse refers to or implies the need for spiritual healing of sinners, that sin can cause spiritual, emotional, mental suffering that can be alleviated by repentance from sin. And of course, repentance means changed behavior to become more in line with God's laws and ways. <coughs> spiritual and physical healing is made possible by the mercy of God. And then back to this middle sentence. But go, Jesus said, and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. So go, interact with other people, see their needs, and try as we are able to supply, to help, to relieve suffering, both physical and spiritual. God desires in his children a merciful attitude and approach expressed in word and deed. The title of the sermon today is Mercy, Go and learn what this means. Today, let's consider an aspect of what Jesus instructed in this verse. Let us learn more of what mercy means and discuss why we should offer it and its intended effects. It's a very large subject. So what we'll be covering today is just a, a beginning, beginning look at it. So let's go to Matthew 23. Matthew 23 and verse 23. Jesus was again talking with Pharisees, scribes. Verse 23, he said, Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, but have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. So mercy is one of the weightier matters of the law. Now, the law referred to here includes the Ten Commandments of God, which were codified at Mount Sinai. The Apostle Paul in Romans 7, you might as well turn there, Romans 7, Romans 7 and verse 12. Well, I'll, I'll go back to Romans 7, verse 7. Romans 7, verse 7, Paul said, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I wouldn't have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said you should not covet. Well, it's the Ten Commandments he's referring to. And down in verse 12, therefore the law, the Ten Commandments being referred to here, is holy, and the commandment holy, just, and good. And then in verse 14, we know that the law is spiritual. So the Ten Commandments are holy, just, and good, and spiritual. 
Thus, the Ten Commandments are in force today and forever. Something spiritual remains. And they are part of the fabric of this universe as much as gravity and electromagnetism. Those who believe otherwise misunderstand or ignore the clear teachings of the Bible and the Apostle Paul. Back in Matthew 23, 23, it says, judgment, mercy, and faith. Now, judgment is the old King James. The new King James is justice, mercy, and faith. And that word translated judgment in the old King James or justice in the new King James comes from the Greek word chrysin. I don't know exactly how to pronounce it. K-R-I-S-I-N, chrysin, chrysin, which means decision, a decision. And by extension, it means a tribunal or by implication, justice. So why is this first? Because you have to have justice first. You must discern some wrong behavior or words based on God's law of love before the issue of mercy even arises. Just as judgment in English can have two major aspects, discernment and condemnation, we will see that mercy in English has two major meanings, forgiveness and compassion pity, compassion slash pity. The meaning of mercy in English can be further enriched when we better understand the words used in Hebrew and Greek to describe God's mercy towards humanity. So let's start with English first. Merriam-Webster has, and I give the first three definitions here. One, compassion or forbearance shown especially to an offender or to one subject to one's power. So that compassion or forbearance, that includes forgiveness there. And then it goes on lenient or compassionate treatment. Number two, mercy is a blessing that is an act of divine favor or compassion. And three, compassionate treatment of those in distress. So compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone to whom it is within, what God's, uh, within one's power to punish or harm is an understanding of mercy in English. It can be an event to be grateful for, especially because its occurrence prevents something unpleasant or provides relief from suffering. And the synonyms in English that are most often given are pity, compassion, grace, and charity. We all can rejoice in God's forgiveness slash mercies toward us. He forgives our sins because of Christ's sacrifice. We do not need to carry the weight of guilt over past sins that we've repented of. Remember the lessons but do not obsess over the faults or the mistakes. God is merciful to us. He forgives our sins and shows compassion and blessings. So let's look more now at the forgiveness aspect of mercy. Let's go back to Exodus 25. Forgiveness, mercy in Exodus 25. Exodus 25 and I'll just drop down to verse 17, I believe. It's talking here about a mercy seat. The whole section is talking about the Ark of the Testimony in which the Ten Commandments, the two tablets were placed. And then verse 17 of Exodus 25, you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, a cubit and a half its width. You shall make two cherubim of gold, of hammered work you shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. One cherub at one end, one cherub on the other. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings. They shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark. And in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. Those are the Ten Commandments. And I will meet with you and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat from between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the testimony about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. So this passage describes the mercy seat on top of the ark. In the Hebrew text, mercy seat is translated from the word kaporeth, Strong's 37.27. It means lid or cover. It's a primary root to cover. It means to expiate, to placate, to cancel. And it's translated among other verses, that word as atonement, reconciliation, purge, forgive, 
or pacify. Now the mercy seat is mentioned in Exodus 25, also in Exodus 37, Leviticus 16, and number 7. It was the center of Israelite worship, where the high priest went once a year on Yom Kippur, the day of the covering, to sprinkle blood to cover the sins of the nation. Mercy was a central concept in the God-revealed original religion of ancient Israel. Let me say that again. Mercy was a central concept of the God-revealed original religion of ancient Israel. Clearly, mercy here is forbearance or forgiveness of sin, which shows God's compassion. And we know that sin, otherwise in the Bible, is defined as the transgression of the law of God, transgression of the Ten Commandments. It is also interesting to note, for those who want to make a study of it, that the economic system that was proposed to ancient Israel was also based on forgiveness. Forgiveness of short-term debts every seven years, and forgiveness of long-term land debts every 50 years. Let's go to Psalm 103. Psalm 103. So we've seen the mercy seat was the center of Israelite religion, and forgiveness was very important. In Psalm 103, I'll start in verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities. Forgives all your iniquities. That word forgives is salach. That's Strong's 5545. It means forgive, pardon. And it's the forgiveness extended to a sinner by God. And this is the verb used for pardon and forgiveness in the Hebrew scriptures. And one most directly. There's other few other verbs or words that include that in sort of their ancillary meanings, but this is the main one. Let's go to the New Testament. Luke 23. Luke 23 and verse 34. Luke 23 and verse 34. Jesus is on the cross. They're crucifying him. There's a criminal on the right hand and one on the left. Luke 23, 34. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. That word is in Greek, afiemi. Afiemi, Strong's 863. It's forgiveness, and it's described as an intense form of the verb to send away, to send away. Jesus asked for their sin to be sent away because they were ignorant of what they were really doing. They, they knew they were killing him, but they didn't understand the whole aspect, that it was the Son of God, that this was completely and totally unjust what they were doing to him. They were just following orders. They were instruments of the state, the, 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 the soldiers who were doing this. And so it's interesting that sin is sent away. That word is to send away. We see something like that in Ephesians chapter 4, another word. And I'm not trying to cover all the words that mean these things, but just some of the major ones. So we have an understanding of forgiveness and how it's used, that forgiveness mercy. Ephesians 4 and verse 31 Ephesians 4 and verse 31, it says, Let all bitterness and wrath, anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ, God in Christ forgave you. Now, this word for forgiving here is charizomai. It's from the word charis or charis, from which we get the word charity. So it means love or favor. And it's interesting in this whole passage here too, it's talking about evil things being put away, being put away. So I just, I find that interesting that both, you know, in this passage and in Christ on the cross, 
sin is being sent away. And here, sin is being sent away by love, by a form of love that carries on the eye. So is God's forgiveness mercy a central part of the message of the New Testament Church of God? Absolutely. So what is this forgiveness mercy? What is it? You could define it this way, giving up all claim to revenge or compensation on the account in question. When you forgive, you're giving up all your claim. You might have a rightful claim. You might think you have a rightful claim, but you're giving up all claim to revenge or compensation on, account, on the account in question. You cease to feel resentment. That's harder for many people. And we have to remember that this giving up claim to vengeance, vengeance is God's. He will repay. He will repay. So when we forgive someone, we give up all claim to revenge or compensation on the account of question. We cease to feel resentment. There are preconditions to this. Normally, preconditions to forgiveness are normally humility and repentance on the part of the offender. Normally, it's humility and repentance. Now, we should know that many times an offender is unaware or ignorant of the sin being committed. Aspiring lawyers are taught in a beginning class in university that more than 90% of all hurts, injuries, or insults afflicted on others are unintentional. The vast majority are unintentional. I didn't mean to step on your toe. You know, I, I didn't mean to insult you. I mean, the words came out wrong. Um, you know, I didn't mean to bump you, you know, as I was trying to get by. Most of these things are unintentional. The offender did not mean to hurt or insult the other person. They were just careless or didn't understand that their words would hurt. So we all need to remember that the other guy most likely didn't mean to insult or hurt us. So therefore, we should be patient and kind, using Jesus as an example. God is ready to forgive us upon humility and repentance. And he wants us to be ready to offer forgiveness and mercy if there is humility and repentance. Let's go back to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. Verse 14. Acts 3 verse 14. Well, I'll start in verse 13. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who has preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things. So we see here that there was ignorance. The, even the rulers, they thought they knew what they were doing. But we see here that Peter's explained to them that they did it in ignorance. At least there was partial ignorance of really what the meaning was. And so they were ignorant, so that time came for they, they should repent. They should repent. And God waited about 40 years, about 40 years, for them to repent. But there was no national repentance. And so the nation was destroyed in about 70 AD. Acts 17, Acts 17, and verse 29. Acts 17, verse 29. 
It says, therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we are not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art or man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked. King James says God winked at. <laughs> he overlooked. But now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. So the times of ignorance God winked at, he overlooked, but he calls all mankind everywhere to repent, to change from the behavior that leads to mental, emotional, and physical suffering. Now, even if one is ignorant of committing a sin, there are still consequences. Let's go back to Luke 12. Luke 12, you, you can't just say, well, I really didn't know what I was doing, so you know, it's not fair for me to suffer at all. That's not the way it works. Luke 12 and verse 47. Luke 12, 47 says, And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. So yes, if one is ignorant and commits a sin, there's still going to be consequences. Still going to be some consequences. And this is one reason, in terms of the ignorance, why Christ spoke in parables. He spoke in parables in order to be able to offer mercy and lenience. So he hid the meaning. He hid the meaning so that he could show mercy. Now, I just want to make a little aside here um, that, you know, our children are unaware of God's standards of right and wrong unless and until we teach them. And so we must teach them, teach them. And our example is chief among the teaching tools for our children. We need to explain God's ways again and again and show that mercy forgiveness, that forbearance, that patience with love in great measure with others, but especially with our children. We need to tell our children we love them. We need to hug them. Appropriate physical touch depending on the age and sex of the child. Explain God's ways again and again. Every Sabbath, make joyful time with our children. Every day love them with mercy and kindness. Now let's go on to the second major part of mercy in English. We've talked a little bit about mercy forgiveness. Let's talk about mercy compassion. This type of mercy in English is even broader than forgiveness. Mercy uncovers many situations. So back in the Old Testament, there are several different words for mercy. And some are kindness, favor to others, compassion. Let's go back again. Uh, we'll go back to Psalm 130. Psalm 130. Psalm 130. We'll start in verse 3. Psalm 130 and verse 3. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, that you may be feared. So again, that word forgiveness is salach, pardon. But what is this verse 4 all about? There is forgiveness with you that you may be feared? What do, how do we understand that? And I would say that forgiveness is not normal in this universe. Newton's third law of motion generally states that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. In other words, the consequences fit the action. The universe is pretty implacable. Uh, gravity works whether you like it or not, whether you believe in it or not. These things happen. But God has the power to override the norm of the universe and be lenient and forgiving with us. His power is to be feared and respected. We know the price was paid in full by Jesus' sacrifice. And God can intervene at pretty much any time. It makes me think of a story. One of my friends many years ago was walking with a date um, along a uh, mountain trail. 
at uh, Yosemite National Park. And um, you have to be careful, some of these mountain trails, because you know, there's loose rock and so forth. And so this uh, young man, he tripped. <laughs> and so he fell and he started rolling toward the cliff and kept rolling and rolling faster and faster. And of course, his, the way he told me, his date was up there screaming like, ah. And about five, six feet before the edge of this cliff, something picked him up, sat him down right on his rear end, stopped all the motion, stopped, stopped everything, just picked him up, boom. God intervened. The universe would have said, he would keep rolling and go over the cliff. But God can intervene at any time. There is forgiveness with God. Therefore, he is to be feared, respected, honored, admired. He has that power to intervene in the universe and forgive and be lenient. Now, another word besides salak, it's just translated pardon, there's a word for mercy, and this is the word hesed, hesed. We see that in verse 7. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy. With him is abundant redemption. He shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. With the Lord is mercy. And that word is hesed. That's Strong's 2617. And it's really a very, very commonly used word for mercy. Translated mercy in the Old Testament. It's translated mercy 149 times. Kindness, 40 times, loving kindness, 30 times, and a lesser number with other words. But it is that covenant love, that covenant kindness that God had toward ancient Israel, that love that he wants to have toward all humankind. It's that loving kindness, that mercy, that patience, that gentleness, the goodness that he wants to do for everyone. Let's go to Hosea chapter 2. That word hesed is part of a godly marriage. A godly marriage. Hosea chapter 2, verse 19 and 20. We see seven elements of a godly marriage. Seven elements that will be extant in the marriage of Jesus Christ to the church. Hosea 2, verse 19. I will betroth you to me forever. So that's one aspect. God wants human beings, when they're married, to be till death do they part. That's the intent. And when the church is betrothed to Jesus Christ, it is forever, time without end. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness. And of course, we know all of God's commandments are righteousness. And justice, in loving kindness, that word has said, in loving kindness, and mercy, I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. So these are the kind of elements that should be part of a godly marriage. Now, the word hesed is translated loving kindness. The word mercy here comes from a different word, racham, racham. And racham is um, in strong 7349. It means compassion. So there are several different words for that compassion and mercy. We can go back to Psalm 103, and we see hesed and racham are used in the same psalm, Psalm 103. So one, Psalm 103, verse 4, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness, that hesed, and tender mercies, racham, racham. I'll go down to verse 8. The Lord is merciful. Again, that's that raham, a form of that word raham. And gracious, slow to anger, abounding in mercy, abounding in said that loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins or punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his said his loving kindness, mercy, towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. He knows our frame. He remembers we're dust. 
He is eternal. We are so temporary. So God is compassionate. He is kind. He's full of loving kindness. He accepts us. He sets the example for us. And as much as possible, we need to imitate God. So let's go to Matthew 9, verse 27 now. We'll see a little bit uh, New Testament, Greek, Matthew 9, 27. Again, we're learning more about mercy. Jesus instructed us, go and learn what this means. So we're trying to see different aspects of mercy. Matthew 9 and verse 27. When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out, saying, Son of David, have mercy upon us. Have mercy. So this is that compassion, pity. And that comes from the word eleo. It's strong 16, 53, and, and others like that. 59 times trans, eleo is translated compassion or mercy. So have mercy, have compassion, have pity on us. And of course, Jesus did. He did. He touched their eyes, said, according to your faith, let it be unto you. And we see it in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. There is also mercy. Mercy. Philippians chapter 2, verse 27. Philippians 2, 27. He's talking about Epaphroditus. For indeed... He was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy upon him. God had compassion, pity on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. So that compassion, pity of God led to a healing. And so the New Testament is remarkably consistent in the use of forms of aleo for meaning compassion, pity. Compassion, pity. Now, what are some reasons why we should be compassionate, merciful? Well, Micah 6, 8 is one. What does the Lord require of you but to do justly, love mercy, walk humbly? So God requires us to love mercy. Hosea 6, 6, you know, which Jesus quoted, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Matthew 9, 13, Jesus said, go and learn what this means. Learn what mercy means. Matthew 23, 23, we covered that. Jesus said, these things ought to be done. They ought to be done. Let's go to Proverbs 11. Proverbs 11. Proverbs 11 and verse 17. Proverbs 11 verse 17 says, The merciful man does good for his own soul, but he who is cruel troubles his own flesh. So if you're compassionate, and that word is has said, if you have loving kindness, you do good for yourself. You have better personal health. Well, that's, that's a good thing. I think we all want better personal health. Just over a page or two, Proverbs 14, 21. Proverbs 14, 21. It says, he who despises his neighbor sins, but he who has mercy on the poor, happy is he. If we are having mercy on the poor, we will be happy. And that word for happy is blessed, happy, prosperous. These are all good reasons why we should want to be merciful, why we should want to learn what Jesus said for us to learn. So what are some of the intended effects of mercy or compassion? Let's go to Proverbs 16, verse 6, just over the page. Proverbs 16, 6. An intended effect of mercy or compassion it says, in mercy and truth, atonement is provided for iniquity. And by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. So we see mercy is important if we want iniquity to be put away, to be purged. That's one of the intended effects of showing mercy. It's to help that person get rid of that iniquity, to put it away. Proverbs 20 and verse 28. Proverbs 20 and verse 28 Another intended effect of mercy. Proverbs 20, verse 28. Mercy, and here it's has said, that loving kindness, mercy and truth preserve the king. And by loving kindness, again, the, that word is has said again, by has said, he upholds his throne. 
So loving kindness upholds the throne of a king. It helps give respect, honor, and longevity to a government. I, I remember when we were in Jordan, King Hussein was a much beloved king because he was kind to the people. He wanted the best for his people. He wanted to build you know, potable water and educational facilities and all the, the little villages and so forth. He knew his people. He tried his best for his people. He showed that loving kindness. It upheld his throne. Yes, there were people who tried to assassinate him multiple times, but, but that loving kindness that King Hussein showed really did help give strength and longevity to his government and to his throne. Proverbs 28, Proverbs 28 and verse 13. It says, he who covers his sins will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. So a motivator to change bad behavior is rachama or compassion. So if you confess and forsake sins, you'll have mercy. So it, it's a motivator. You know, I, I, I'm willing to confess and forsake sins because I want mercy. I go to God, please have mercy upon me. Please have mercy upon me. So I confess and forsake my sins. Matthew 5 and verse 7. Matthew 5 and verse 7. This is part of that Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5 and verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the merciful. So it's one of, again, a reason for showing mercy. But, you know, if you show mercy, you obtain mercy for those who show it. It's, it's one of those things of God. And that's that compassionate sympathy, that pity, that aleo that we've talked about. So how do we show mercy in today's world? Well, let's go to Romans 12. Romans 12. How do we show mercy? And it's not really rocket science. It's, uh, it's pretty common sense in a way. But Romans 12, verse 6, we'll start. Romans 12, verse 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If the gift is prophecy, let us prophesy in accordance to our faith. Or ministering, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. That's, that's sort of hard. If you have ever supervised people, especially in the bureaucracy, you know, you, you want to show mercy. If you're going to show mercy, you might as well do it with cheerfulness, not grudgingly, because if, you, if you're grudgingly showing mercy, you don't get a whole lot of benefit from that with the employee. But if you're going to show mercy, do it with cheerfulness. It's what God says to do. It's a, it's a gift, and we need to pray for that. So we can show mercy by kind treatment of other people. We can show mercy by being kind to others, by politeness, by respect of other people. And you think, well, doesn't everybody do that? Well, you ask yourself in our society today. We can show mercy by relieving suffering which can be emotional stress, physical hunger, or thirst. That's showing mercy. We can show mercy by lenient treatment. In other words, not exacting the full legal limit of retribution towards someone who offends or hurts us. That's a mercy as well. So what is desired in a man or woman? Let's go back to Proverbs 19. Proverbs 19. And verse 22, Proverbs 19 and verse 22, what is desired in man is has said, loving kindness, and a poor man is better than a liar. But this is that word translated mercy. What is desired in a man or woman is mercy, loving kindness, has said. Compassion, pity, kindness, that's desire. That's what people want to see in us. Do people want to see strength? So you can be a strong person, but without kindness, maybe that's a bit dangerous. 
How about beauty? A beautiful woman who's not kind, that could be sort of dangerous too. Do people desire someone who always thinks they have to be right? I don't think so. Do people desire to be around someone who likes to argue? I don't think that's what they want either. One of our goals, I believe, should be to be known for mercy, kindness, that politeness, that respect towards others. We should do periodic self-examination throughout the year. As we examine ourselves throughout the year, one of the areas we need to think deeply about is how merciful are we? How hard are we on other people? How compassionate? How forgiving are we toward other people? And do we show mercy with cheerfulness? So let's summarize. Again, this is just a, a small part of what Christ wants us to learn. And he said, I desire that you go and learn what this means, mercy. Mercy in English has two major components, forgiveness and compassion slash pity. Forgiveness from God is a mercy. It's an act of kindness that is possible if the offense was done in ignorance, in other words, not willful, and upon humility and repentance. In addition, we do acknowledge the need to accept the sacrifice, the blood of Jesus Christ, to cover our sins and to put them away that they might be forgiven. Jesus in Matthew 23, verse 23, talked about mercy. And that kind of mercy he talked about there was eleo, the compassion, pity, is one of the weightier matters of the law. God wants us to have that compassion and mercy. The intended effects of this compassion and mercy includes purging iniquity, obtaining mercy for those who show mercy, giving honor and respect to an administration, and as a motivator to change bad behavior. So compassion and mercy should be an integral part of our character. Kind treatment of others, politeness and respect for others is what Christ modeled and we should imitate him. What is desired in a man and a woman is mercy, loving kindness and compassion. This kind of mercy will indeed endure forever.